Amen. Good morning. My name is Brian. It's good to be with you this morning. Thank you, Haney's. Um, then the God's word says that that as followers of of Jesus, we are to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs and um, to sing words like we did this morning. I needed that. Like I, I wrestling with the things that we wrestle oftentimes in my own head, doubt or discouragement to hear my brothers and sisters sing along with me to trust in him, to believe in him and in his faithfulness. Um, and so here at Bedrock, we look to um, sing the word of God, to, to preach the word of God, to teach it, to pray it. Um, and today we'll be in Joshua chapter 20 and, and chapter 21. So we're going to be in, in two chapters. Uh, if you go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, we have some at the end of the rows. Um, and if you, if you want to take that home, that is yours. We'd love for you to own a copy of God's word. Uh, my first question for us this morning is, have you ever had a moment in your life, an action that you made that caused immediate regret? <laughs> it caused you to immediately know that there was going to be consequences. It almost made you feel like, and I need to run to like a safe place. I need to retreat. I've had uh, too many moments like that in my lifetime. Uh, one that came to mind as I was thinking over was uh, my mentor in college. His name is Greg Peters, pastor out in Florida, in invested so much more than I deserved of time into my life. Um, and kind of one of those pers people like, can I ever repay him with uh, just serving him and blessing him? And so one time he was fixing up a condo and uh, he knew that I had the coolest truck in the world and that I could help go get some uh, appliance for him and, and take it back to the condo. I actually still have the Ranger Splash logo. I took off the truck before I sold it. And so uh, a 95 Ford Ranger Splash, I should have never sold it. I missed it. I could fit anything in the back of that little pickup. I mean, if I, as long as I had my straps, I could stack things. And it was offensive when somebody would be like, are you sure that's all gonna fit? Like, do we need to get a bigger truck? Um, and so Greg asked me to go to the appliance store, pick up a stove for him. Um, it had this sleek glass stove top, uh, and I was being as careful as possible, had the guy help me get it onto the back of my truck bed, and I grabbed my straps. I, I grabbed two of them just to make sure that it, that it wasn't good. I didn't want it to tip over, right? I didn't want to drive and hit a, a bump in the road and that beautiful stove break. And so I put two straps over the top of it, one on each side, and I start, and I do one crank, right? And I, I you know, I keep cranking, a couple more cranks. I just want to get it tight. You want it snug. You don't want it to tip over. One more crank, and then just, just one more. Crack. Shatter. The whole glass stovetop just in pieces. Immediately, I felt this like, I'm an idiot. Why did I do that? Like, I was trying to be too careful. And, and now I have to face Greg and tell him that this simple just um, project that he gave me, I, I screwed it up. And so I, sit, I honestly sat there in the parking lot of that appliance store way too long, uh, avoiding the phone call. He's a nice guy. I, there was nothing. He wasn't going to be unkind to me about it. I just, just felt the weight of it. And um, I called him. I, 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 he said, uh, B, did you, uh, did you do it on purpose? And I said, no. He said, then don't worry about it. <laughs> so he was very, very gracious. But I say that because I think that's a light, uh, it's a lighthearted story um, with no real consequences today. But our text today, it actually truly, we find people in the darkest the, the most difficult, the most fearful, consequential moments of their life. To be specific, our text today talks about people who find themselves accidentally killing another person and then having to retreat, having to find shelter, feeling the guilt and the weight of that. And that they would go and, and that God would establish these cities of refuge for protection, for them to be able to go and, and plead their case, and that in that city they'd be protected from the avenger of blood, from the death of, of their family member. It's a place where mercy would be found. 
You see, today we're talking about this biblical idea, this beautiful truth, this idea of the word refuge. That refuge can be described as a safe retreat, a place of safety and rescue in the middle of trial. In the Old Testament, it's described as a high rock, a secure dwelling place and a place to flee. And isn't that what we all long for? If we're honest with ourselves, uh, this is where we find ourselves spiritually. We're going to see this in the text today, that uh, we go and we run and we, find a try, we try to find refuge in everyone and everything but God. And deep down, we know we are strapped down like that stovetop under the weight and the guilt and the pressure of our sin towards God, deserving only of death as punishment, feeling broken and shattered like that glass unable to run from the consequences of our own sin, of our own mistakes, of our own guilt, or situations in our life that are too big for us to handle, that knock us down, that cause the wind to be out of us. It's a joy today to say that we find a gracious and a merciful God who offers us refuge in himself. The big idea we're going to talk about today, the the two points that we're going to see by the end of our time is that we find refuge in Jesus and we represent Jesus as his royal priesthood. Let's pray. God, I thank you for, um, man, this time together this morning already. We're just asking, Spirit, would you lead? I just, I long that we would see Jesus in this text today, that we would see the refuge that we have in you, that we would see what you intended for us to see in your word, in the Old Testament, in the book of Joshua, in the story of your people. God, would you be that same God that teaches us today, that calls us into your safety, into your refuge. God, I I know we all come in different places this morning and in a different place in our heart, but God, may we all find that you are the one that we can trust. We thank you uh, for your word today. Well, you got us in your name. Amen. All right, this might not, not be a passage that we often go to. Uh, maybe you haven't heard a sermon on it before, but I'm excited to jump into it. So if you'll go to Joshua chapter 20, we're going to start in verse 1. And it says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people of Israel, Appoint the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there, They shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood. He shall flee to one of these cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and explain his case to the elders of that city. Then they shall take him into the city and give him a place and he shall remain with them. And if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give up the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past, and he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment, until the death of him who is high priest at that time. Then the manslayer may return to his own town and his own home to the town in which he fled. See, last week uh, in our our passage in, in Um, 13 through 19, we saw that the land, uh, much of it has been conquered. There's still some to still be conquered, but the land started to be allotted and portioned out to the different tribes. It was God fulfilling his promise to his people. And things that we're seeing that we've been noticing is that God continues to long to live as God's people, that they would be set apart, that the goal wasn't the land, right? The goal wasn't the land, but that God wanted to be with his people and shape them with his love. And he cares more so about who they are becoming than the actions that they take. He's shaping them. And so we're going to see that here today, that uh, the context of this time, this is ancient times. Okay, Uh, this is this is different. They didn't have paramedics. They didn't have uh, a police department. Uh, They didn't have an easy way to to get to a hospital. This society, it sadly had high death rates um, and accidents would happen that resulted in death. Things like a tool that scripture describes flying off a handle and accidentally striking someone. Maybe um, someone plowing through a field and, you know, somebody was sleeping in the grass. 
There's these accidents that happen, maybe a playful fight that, that accidentally went too far and someone loses their life. And God wisely and graciously establishes and sets up these cities to be available for those that found themselves in this difficult and dangerous situation. You can imagine. God instructed them to establish six cities. Um, you'll see them on the screen behind me with three on the east side of the Jordan River and three on the west side of the Jordan River. See, these, they were strategically um, set throughout the, the land of Canaan so that one was always within 30 miles of where you were so that they were available. 30 miles was the distance that most people would, would be able to travel in one day. So if you found yourself in this terrible situation, there was always a place of refuge to run. So if we were to define a city of refuge, if you haven't caught already, it's a place of protection for people who unintentionally committed manslaughter. When a person accidentally killed someone, the killer could flee to a city of refuge. They could have their case heard by the elders at the, at the front of the gate. And if they were deemed to, to truly have not uh, been intentional with this, this killing, they, they would be brought in for protection from someone called the Avenger of Blood. We'll talk about that. For full detail on the cities of refuge, this is actually something that God commanded Moses to, to instruct them to do back in Numbers chapter 35. He says, they will be places of refuge from the avenger so that anyone accused of murder may not die before they stand before trial before the assembly. Now, uh, Halloween is in two days, right? It's, it's right here. And I think the avenger of blood for sure sounds like somebody that you would dress up on for Halloween. It sounds like somebody that you would be scared of death to ever meet. It's not a word that's familiar to us. Uh, a similar, uh, the similar name for this person would have been a kinsman redeemer. So you might recognize that from like the story of Boaz. Uh, but the avenger of blood was a designated family member who could legitimately avenge the death of someone in their family. So if this happened, someone was killed, even if it was accidentally, the avenger of that family would pursue that person. They would look to repay blood for blood. I know that's that's crazy to hear, uh, but it was an acceptable punishment for killing someone in that time. And if the killer sla um, stayed in town, they would have to look over their shoulder. Like if this happened to you, you would be constantly like trying to look around the corner because you never knew when this person would be pursuing you. So let's put it all together. Um, in Deuteronomy, it gives the example again, maybe two friends, they go out into uh, the woods and they, as they always did, they're chopping some wood. Um, uh, I'm sure they didn't have like a Lowe's that they could run to and, and get a new axe every time that they went out. I'm sure that the axes were uh, probably much, um, much, much less quality. But say they, they, one person chopped the wood, they chopped it, uh, and they needed a break. They lie in the grass behind. The other person chops the wood, and an accident happens. Flies off the handle. The guy, his friend, he, he immediately runs feels guilty, immediately runs, picks them up, carries them back to town. But by the time he gets back, he's lost his life. And he's, this man is immediately knows it just completely changes his life. He immediately knows that this will define him for forever. Um, he's mourning over the loss of his friend and, and obviously what his family is going to experience. And everything changes from here. He's processing, man, what's next? But by the grace of God, there was a place for him to run. There's a place for him to find shelter as he's figuring this out. Uh, so he says goodbye to his family members. He laces up his shoes. He runs to the closest city of refuge in uh, Bezer, Bezer, however you say it. Um, and he gets to the edge of the city gate. He explains the situation. The elders weigh it out, consider it. They, they listen to witnesses. <coughs> And they welcome them in. They give them a place to stay. They give them protection. The city, though, is more, it's, it's even more than a residence. It's a refuge. It protects them. But not only that, it's kind of like a prison because he can't leave. If he were to ever leave, the avenger of blood could then pursue him. See, I know that's, again, a very foreign concept, but I think it's going to, we're going to see how it all comes together here in a moment. But there's a couple of things, just principles that I think uh, I, would, I would not, 
I, I don't want to look over that, that come out of this text, just in observ observations here. First, we've seen this over and over again. We talked about how God did this with the land of Canaan, but God brings chaos to order. God didn't want this cycle of, of blood for blood to continue to happen, of violence to, uh, to continue to ensue. And so God brings order. He brings justice. He brings mercy into the picture. That's who he is. He's creating a culture where life would be valued and violence would not continue to happen. See, God cares also what, what we see is that God cares about the motivation of the heart. It's clear that he, he looks at the intent of the person uh, in which this happens. It's an important distinction God makes in the passage that uh, he cares about the intent of the killer. He doesn't blindly just see the action, right? He, he takes into account the intention of the heart. He made a place for those that ki uh, killed without intent or unknowingly. Now, what's the other side of that? Obviously, the distinction would be those that um, that would intentionally, full of hate, uh, planning to take the life of another person. This was clearly murder. This was in violation of God's command. This would bring punishment. You see, in today's terms, we have terms like um, voluntary manslaughter or involuntary manslaughter or um, premeditated murder. This are, are things that we get from the scriptures. Numbers 35, 20 to 21, it says, if anyone with malice or forethought shoves, an shoves another or throws something at them intentionally so that they die, or if out of enmity one person hits another with their fists so that the other dies, that person is to be put to death. That person is a murderer. So we see a distinction here. And I think uh, for me, it just caused me to pause and just remember, not just in these situations, but man, we got to consider the motives of our heart. God knows and sees the motives of our heart, the intent behind the actions that we take. Like, are we truly loving this person out of selfless love or is it more what we can gain? Is it more selfishness and pride that drives us? Like, am I truly obeying God with a, with a grateful and a willing heart in this area of my life that I don't want to give up or am I I'm full of bitterness? I'm full of frustration towards God. We'd be wise uh, more often than we do to have a heart check-in, uh, to pause and reflect on the, the ways in which we're living and where our heart is. So the next thing we see uh, is that God prizes human life above all creation. This is a, a beautiful, beautiful thing in which there is nothing like humanity in all of God's creation. Like God created an incredible, beautiful, stunning world. I mean, I go to the zoo all the time with my girls. I go to the aquarium all the time. There are some amazing things. But God says above all of those uh, that he created, he, he just, the, uh, humanity is the apple of his eye. That he stamped only in humanity his image and his likeness. That we would reflect who God is, that in every human being there is worth and value and purpose and meaning, that no life should ever be taken, mistreated, overlooked, undervalued. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion. See, I just want to remind us that you matter to God. Please hear that, that we are so good at degrading and devaluing ourselves and other people. Please know that God cares deeply for you. He has a purpose for you, that you were made with intentionality. You're the apple of God's eye. You're not a mistake. You are immensely valuable. This, is, this causes us, hopefully, to, to lift up our eyes when we're walking on the sidewalk. When we see other humans in our neighborhood, that, that we would be willing to say hi. It, I, I loved in our class recently, Paul Tripp, uh, he was talking about this city and he was talking about how someone uh, was like, how do you stand like not seeing all of God's beautiful creation, you know, like we do out in the country? And he says, well, in the city, I see God's beautiful creation all over with every person that walks by. I see more of it than anybody. See, as Christians, we should care about what God cares about. And we're called to love people, to fight for the vulnerable and hurting, to share the good news that Jesus restores us 
this is why it's devastating when we hear things like what happened this past week in, in Maine and the mass shootings that happened. We would demand justice, that, that we would pray over the violence in our city, that we would value human life because that comes from God, our creator. So because of this, we see in the text that life is valuable to God no matter how it is taken. Therefore, even the accidental taking of a life in the situation, it, it even has a consequence. It brings him them exile in the city of refuge. God explains in uh, the Israelites in Numbers 35 that any bloodshed, intentional or unintentional, polluted the land in which he dwelled, that the murder must face the consequence of death, and the un unintentional killer must be removed to the city of refuge. And my last observation here before we get into the heart of the text is God is just, but just, but he is also rich in mercy. God is just, but he's also rich in and mercy. Okay, did you catch that part in the in the passage where it said that uh, what it said about the high priest? It said that the killer in the city of refuge could never leave, or the avenger of blood would pursue them. They could uh, they would get the word and they would chase them down. And it says, except if the high priest during the time of their trial dies, if the high priest dies, they can leave. They're good to go. The avenger of death, uh, the avenger of blood, would they would accept the death of the high priest in place of that person's um, own death? You know, there's no ransom that anybody could pay, no amount of money, no bargains could be made, but only the life of the killer or the atoning death of the high priest. It says in Joshua 26, this is where he says, And he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment, until the death of him who is high priest at the time. Then the manslayer may return to his own town and in his own town to the town from which he fled. Now there's no telling how fair this might have felt. Like you might have a high priest who is really young and you're like, this is going to take forever. I'm going to be waiting a long time. Or you might have a high priest that is older at the time that a situation happens and, and maybe your freedom comes more quickly. But it's not necessarily about the fairness of this. What I think this is trying to highlight, what God intended for us to see, is that it's, this is the only way for us to fully understand the price of blood guilt. The need for atonement. For the judgment that one deserves. See, the beauty of this is that the high priest symbolically atones for the sin of the manslayer and points to the greater high priest that we have in Jesus. What we see in this passage and we see throughout Joshua is that God is just, but he's also merciful. These are two things that seem like they can't exist together. God rightly punishes sin, but he also offers mercy to those that come to him. You remember that with the Gibeonites? These deceitful group of people, they come, but they, they come to the, the Israelites and they're given safety. They're not, their lives aren't taken. Or think about, uh, uh, think about Rahab, the prostitute in the city of Jericho. She turns and she admits that God is a true God. She puts a scarlet thread out of her window and her life is spared. You know, what's even more mind-blowing is that from her line that she uh, would come, to, uh, that what Jesus would come. That the greater high priest, the, the perfect lamb, the son of God would come to make atonement for sin came from the line of Rahab. The one that we could find true refuge in. See, point number one is we find refuge in Jesus. Back to the feeling I described at the very beginning of the sermon is that we all feel the weight of our sin and we know that we're deserving of punishment, of death. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's including myself, everyone. It's, none of us are excluded from what we know is true of ourselves if, if we're willing to admit it or not. Not even the high priests in the Bible were void of sin. The, the Levitical priests, they failed God and they were terrible representatives. They too had to offer sacrifices to God for their own sin on top of the sins of the people. They pointed, to, uh, they pointed us to realize that we needed the greater high priest that would be perfect, righteous, blameless, and eternal. Listen to this verse in Hebrews 7. It says, 
For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, for first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. See, in Jesus, I need you to hear this today, in Jesus, the full wrath of God was satisfied. Jesus takes our place where we deserve punishment. He offers us mercy. It's fully available to us at the cross. You see, God shows mercy through his justice. He doesn't set justice aside to make room for mercy. But Christ took our sin and punishment and substitution for us and satisfied the full wrath of God. Because of this, God extends his mercy to the undeserving. Anyone that will come to him, anyone that will confess their need for him, they can find refuge in God, restore relationship, will be saved. Jesus is our city of refuge. Unlike the cities of refuge where you had to be innocent and you come to the front gate and if you were innocent, they'd let you in. We come to Jesus fully guilty, undeserving of his mercy, and he welcomes us in. We admit our need for him. You see, and just like the cities were spread out and available, Jesus offers his free gift to all that will come to him. Hebrews 6, 18 through 20, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf and having become a high priest forever. So our, our whole life doesn't have to be uh, defined anymore by the guilt that we carry, the sins that, that we keep secret, the anxiety that we feel, but Jesus transforms us for his purposes. We are brought from darkness into light. And I long for us all to know that, to remember what we have in Jesus. Don't continue living as if he hasn't forgiven you. I want to remind us today to, to run to your refuge. Seek your, seek your safe place in him. Uh, David in the Psalms demonstrates that so well for us. So many moments that he was fleeing for his life, running. I love the song that we sing today. It reminded us that, <laughs> uh, that we're uh, praying to the same God, the same God of Moses, the same God as David. Psalm 62, 5 through 8. David cries out, for God alone, oh, my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Man, I just want to remind you to, to bring yourself before him. Just like David did, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what you might be going through this week, but you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, and even if you're not, God welcomes you to come before Him to pour out your heart, just like David did. He's hiding in a cave and he cries out to God, and, and God hears him. Like, this is me so many times walking home here in Fishtown, just walking on the street be, between here and my house, or or going somewhere. God hears me as I, I'm just like wrestling with the challenges of being a dad or uh, the disappointments that I have in my own heart. I could just cry out to Him. I don't, it doesn't matter where you are. He's a refuge. He's a safe place. Too many times we seek refuge in other things. We dive into addictions. We distract ourselves with entertainment. We hope to secure ourselves from the pain. You can run to God. He's your refuge. He won't let you down. Point number two, I'll hurry quickly here, is we represent Jesus as his royal high priest. So chapter 21, we don't have a lot of time to dive into all of it. I'll just sum it up. Uh, chapter 21, you can read the first six verses. I'll skip it for now. But it is where God gives the inheritance to the, to the Levitical priests or to the, to the Levites. This is where uh, they get um, to, they receive different parts of the land uh, within the cities of the other tribes. They get some pasture land so that they can have uh, what they need for the sacrifices and for their own living. Uh, and the Levites, if you don't know anything about them, these were, this was the, the priestly tribe of Israel. 
These are the ones that maintained the tabernacle. These are the ones that uh, the priests came and they were the ones that represented God to the people and the people to God. They were the ones that, that um, made the sacrifices to God to appease for the sin. They were vital to ensuring that God's people, that the people of Israel would maintain worship and relationship with God. Uh, you have to kind of ask the question though, why didn't they get their own land? It feels like kind of short that all the other tribes would get their a certain region, but they just, they're spread throughout the whole region. They get uh, little portions here and there. And I think what God was doing, he didn't want to keep them hidden. He didn't want to keep them isolated, but he wanted them to represent that God was with his people. He wanted them to, to be embedded throughout the whole land so that they would have a heart for worshiping God, that the people wouldn't forget their whole purpose was to be with him. The reminder that God cared more about worship than warfare. He cared more about consecration above conquest. He cared more about relationship over religion, presence over possession. The presence of God was their greatest possession. It says in Joshua 18, 7, the Levites have no portion among you for the priesthood of the Lord is their heritage. They were representatives of God and they were sent. The Levites always also resided in the cities of refuge. So anywhere there's a city of refuge, there were Levites there as well, and they would help maintain this safe place. See, what I want to get at is that we, too, represent God in our broken world. That we, too, are sent out just like the Levites were sent out. You see, this is where the themes of the Bible come together beautifully, where what seems like a, a section of Scripture to glaze over or to skip or, or doesn't seem related to us, God was establishing something in the Israelites that he would also do in us through Jesus. <laughs> that just like the cities of refuge we find here, as God's people, we have received Jesus as our greater, greater refuge. In turn, we offer that to the world around us, to the hurting across the street, to those in our family, that our church body, collectively, that we can be a safe place for people to experience and know who God is. That we're scattered throughout the city and our, and our work and, and throughout the week on our Monday to extend that same mercy that God has extended to us. You know, people have told me here at Bedrock that when they visit, they're like, man, you people just linger. Linger out in the lobby after the service. They talk and they encourage. I think that's God, God continuing just to, to call us to be a safe place, to be a place where we check in on each other, where we take the time to care. And let's continue to do that. And did you know that Anyone that's found in Jesus is also called a royal priest. It blew my mind this week as I, as I just drew that connection. Did you know, uh, yeah, we don't have a physical temple uh, and that we don't have long robes and, and we're not mediators uh, to God, that our bodies are actually called the temple, that we represent him, that he dwells in us wherever we go. And uh, we too are scattered throughout the land, just like the people in Canaan. Uh, Canaan. Uh, 1 Peter 2, this would be one maybe to read this week and sit in. It says, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see, because we've received that mercy from God, because we know that he's offered us something that we could never on our own, we too get to extend that into the world around us. It humbles us but it also calls us, it reminds us that we are sent. How do we do this? As we close here, man, maybe we just walk in that humility. Maybe, you just, maybe we just needed to remember this morning where we come from. Maybe we need to remember that feeling that we had when, when God met us in our sin and gave us forgiveness in, in Jesus. Maybe that'll help us remember how to extend that same grace to those around us. We do this out of the overflow of our life. We start with, with walking with Jesus, with prayer, with reading his word, with asking for the spirit to lead us. That there'd be an overflow out of our, 
our obedience and our walk with Jesus that just we, it can't help but to uh, impact those around us. That we remember that we have great power in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that we have a guide that, that wants to, to lead us into every moment, into our workplace, into our family life, into our neighborhood. That prayer calls us to believe Him over and over and over again to do the impossible. That we're called to obedience. To live differently than the world around us. To not conform. We're sojourners longing for a heavenly home. The last passage I'll read here is Joshua 21, 43 through 45. This is the end of the passage, end of 21. It's a beautiful statement of God's faithfulness. It says, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side. Just as he had sworn to their fathers, not one of all their enemies had withstood them. For the Lord had given them all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All of them came to pass. And as we've already been singing over and over again this morning, God is faithful. He was faithful to bring them through into the promised land, to give them everything that he promised, to bring them every victory that they needed. But there's still land to be conquered. I think what, what really stood out to me, the last thing I would say is, how do we live out as this royal priesthood? How would he... How do we continue to be uh, places of refuge as, as God has to us? See, we have to live. Uh, we, uh, they had the promise of God, but they also need to live in light of that promise. See, are we living as if every promise that God has made to us will come to pass? Do we really believe that? That God's faithfulness calls for faithfulness in God's people. Believe that God's with you. <laughs> He's faithful to his promises. Everything that God says about not being anxious or casting your cares on him or that he is with you always, that he's returning one day, can give us great confidence to live as his people in this broken world. So as the Hanies come up, as we close, I'm just going to invite you into a time of, of reflection, of prayer. As always, this this front space, we've we've created room up here for anyone that wants to come. Maybe... Maybe you just need to take a moment and thank God for the refuge that he is, for the safe place that he's been. Maybe you're going through a, a moment right now where you have been running to everything but our loving God. And you just need to give it to him. It might feel like, man, it, it might still feel like there's nothing he can do. Or you might still doubt his power over the situation. It might feel too great. Just come to him anyways. Talk to him. He wants to hear from you. He wants to be a safe place that we can run to. If you've never placed your faith in the great high priest, in Jesus, who's given everything so that we can have life, would you call upon his name? Confess that sin that's weighing us down. Trust in him as Savior and, and the work that he did to die on the cross to defeat death in the grave, to rise again and to return one day. And you'll find life. you find refuge that will always be there. So I just invite you to take time to pray before the Haney sing their next song. God, we, we just ask that you would lead us um, to trust you, to run to you, to believe that you're good. You're merciful. God, that you would in turn help us in humility to offer that mercy to those around us, to long for people to know that same refuge. We love you in your name. Amen.